entitled our uh, message here, uh, The Lord is, wait, let me see if my, you know, it's funny. Oh, do we have the, uh, there we go. The Lord is my portion. Um, you know, for, for all the promises of God are in him, yes and amen. That's what Paul says in, in Corinthians, to the glory of God through us. We're going to be seeing tonight uh, misunderstandings. We all have misunderstandings. What do we do when we hit those misunderstandings? How do we handle them? We're going to talk about conflict resolution, and we'll see how many other things that we can um, uh, kind of glean from uh, these two chapters. Uh, we're going to look at chapter 21, and it's simply, we're going to read the very beginning of it and the very end of the chapter, and I'm not going to read the whole entire middle part. And it's basically the Levi's land, uh, the Levites' land allotments. And so I'll throw up a map and, and we'll be able to see uh, um, some things from, from that. Uh, but with that, there's some great stuff in the beginning and, and the ending of it for us tonight. And you're saying, Brian, you're saying the middle part isn't great. Well, it was for them. But unless you're a Levite, um, it's, you know, it's just like, here's, their, here's the map that they got. Remember when we covered those five chapters all together, that was the, the other 11 tribes, and now we hit their tribe, and this is what they get, and we'll talk about the differences and, and why. And then uh, uh, chapter two is kind of the, the wrap-up of this whole land allotment and, and that, and there's some good stuff in that. So um, let me go ahead and read the uh, uh, first three verses did I just, yeah, there we go. All right, we'll read these three and then we'll jump right into it. Then the heads of the father's houses of the Levites came to Eliezer, the, the priest, and to Joshua, the son of Nun, and to the heads of the father's houses of the tribes of the people of Israel. And they said to them at Shiloh in the land of Canaan, the Lord commanded through Moses that we be given cities to dwell in along with their pasture lands for our livestock. So by the command of the Lord, the people of Israel gave to the Levites the following cities and pasture lands out of the inheritance. Now I'll pause right there and just say, I don't know why they're having to come to them. They had spent all of those chapters explaining all of the different, okay, the Reubenites are going to be over here and, and Ephraim, you get this land over here. And, and we have chapters of that. And then did they just forget about the Levites? And so the Levites are having to approach them and the high priest and also Joshua, who was, remember, Moses' kind of general, then Moses dies, and then he gets to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. They've been in the land, and then they've uh, conquered the, the center area, and they went to the north and took care of the south. And basically, this has been a seven-month kind of journey for them, and now they've pushed out uh, most of the Canaanites and pretty much everybody of the land. Not everybody, and they'll, that'll come back to bite them later. Uh, but, but with that, everybody's getting all settled, and the Levites are going, hello. What about us? And, and so, and they kind of just remind them, remember God commanded this, and, and he did in, Le, in uh, Numbers and Leviticus and even Deuteronomy. And, and so with that, what that middle portion of chapter 21 is, is they're going to get this section, they're going to get these cities over here, and that's, that's what it is. All of these cities are in the midst of the other 11 tribes, and so they're sharing with the Levites. The reason, like, the Levites, out of all the tribes, are set aside over here is because their day job is to take care of the tab tabernacle, and later on when they build a temple, they're going to take care of everything at the temple. And so with that, remember Moses and Aaron are brothers, and Aaron uh, is, becomes the very first high priest, right? And so we call it the Aaronic priesthood. And uh, so with that, they, he, they're both of the tribe of Levi, but basically... Not all Levites are priests, but all priests are Levites. And so there's different kind of sections of them and probably too much detail. But if you have chapter 21 in front of you in verse 4, 6, and 7, there's the Kohathites, the Gershonites, and the Merorites. Those are the three. Those are the three main kind of sections, how they divide them out. And basically, they're in charge of different things. The Kohathites... Uh, some saw them as being kind of more important because they took care of everything inside of the tabernacle, like even the Ark of the Covenant, right? So when they would go to move, when they're in, sh in, the, in the wilderness for so many years, when they would go to move, those guys would go in first and cover everything up so nobody would be able to see like the Ark of the Covenant. And then you would get in a certain priest that'd be able to carry it and lift it out. So they took care of all of that stuff. 
with the other guys, uh, the Gershonites, uh, they were uh, basically in charge of the tent, if you will. And then the last one, the Mirites, they're, they're, they're in charge of the, the tent poles and those kind of things. And so they squawk a little bit later, uh, actually back in numbers about, well, why do they get the important jobs? We don't have it. But anyways, that's what they're doing. And they're broken up. They're doing all of these different things. But ultimately, they get, they get 48 cities. The rest of them got huge chunks of land. They get specific cities. That's what's doled out to them. And a little bit of pasture land for their sheep and whatever animals that they have. So they, at the end of the book of Numbers, Levites numbered at about 23,000. So they count them up, and so they're about 23,000. So they're given these 48 towns, and so that's roughly about 480 of them will be in these different towns that, they're, uh, that, they, that they get. And so in total, Levites receive 48 cities with their surrounding pasture lands. They say the priests were never more than 10 miles away from anybody living anywhere. So that's kind of interesting as they're kind of dotted all over. We'll see a map in a little bit, but as they're dotted all over the land in these different cities and that, because what they're about is to, well, their, their main job, to proclaim the excellencies of God, reminding always the, the children of Israel of seeking after God. That's what they were to do to all the people. That's what you and I are to be doing as well, right? We're in that sense, we're, we're left here behind. I always say, why didn't God, when he, as soon as I became born again, as age 19, I say, yes, Lord, I want to repent of my sins and believe on you. And at that point, why didn't he just go boom and bring Brian home? Because he has a plan for me here, right? And you also. And so we're to be here to continue to share with others about who God is and how awesome he is. And so that's where the, the priests were within 10 miles of anyone in any of the children of Israel anywhere. Put a scripture behind me, Numbers 18, 20. It says, and the Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land. So this was prophesied, and this is now in, in our book, and Joshua here finally coming to pass. But he says, you shall have no inheritance in the land. Neither shall you have any portion among them. And then he says this, God says this. I love this. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. The Lord told Aaron that the priests and the Levites, though they had no territorial inheritance, would have a greater one, the Lord himself. This meant that Levites would receive tithes from the people as their source of income and their compensation for their service at the, at the tabernacle. And so that's where the tithe came from, is really to, to care for uh, these guys that took care of uh, the, the tabernacle, again, later the temple. And we think, well, that's pretty cool for God to, to single them out and to be able to say, I shall be your portion. But let me ask you a question tonight. What if you don't ever get any inheritance from grandparents, from parents? Um, matter of fact, uh, don't make much money in life, barely scrape by and do all of those things. But the Lord reminds you with a wink, but you got me. Wink, wink. <laughs> but, but it should be that. We should be, we should settle there. We should be comfortable with that. We should, maybe if we're not understanding how beautiful that is, then we need some time to, to think about that and, and, and thank him for that, that he truly is our, our portion and our inheritance. We're going to jump to the end of the chapter. Again, you can kind of, if you have it open, you can go through that, but it's just like, okay. And so then basically each of the different tribes, this tribe has to give up these cities. He names them by name, lists them all out. Those are for the Levites. And he, so he names all the different tribes. That's what he does. But we get to the end of chapter 21, and we have verse 43 through 45 that I have up there. And uh, we have here Joshua's summary statement, basically. And so he says, thus says, excuse me, thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Isn't that a great section right there? He really wraps up with these three promises here. The first promise, that God keeps his covenants, or he keeps his promises. He says, not one word, not one promise has, has failed. Uh, another way we could say it is he is faithful. 
Now, again, this is specifically talking about the children of Israel, their promise to them and everything else. But think about every single promise that he's given you and I. He'd be saying the same thing tonight, right? With a big smile on his face, saying the same thing that, is there, is there one, one of my words that I have given to you, one sentence, one, one phrase, one promise, one covenant that I've made with you that I've broken? No way. 2 Timothy 2.13, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, meaning that, well, Christ's faithfulness to Christians is not contingent on their faithfulness to him. And a lot of times we think that. Matter of fact, we think that a lot of times he owes us because hey, we'll even remind him sometimes in our prayer. Now, when we get a little bit more sophisticated and older in our Christianity, we stop doing that. But, but ultimately, we were saying, you know, Lord, I, I did give this amount of money to such and such, you know, or whatever it is. We kind of nudge him and remind him of those things, thinking that he owes us now. No, even when we are faithless, we can't change his character of who he is. He remains faithful. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24 uh, it's, it's a small book, but it's hard. It's a, it's a lament. It's, it's a lot of confusion. It's a lot of hurt. It's a lot of angst and everything else. But there's this nugget right in the middle of it, at Lamentations 3. I know you, I, I, I'm sure you've heard it before, and I love it, but I forgot about one little phrase in there. And so it starts off in, in Lamentations 3.22, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. But then it said this phrase, Great is your faithfulness. And I, I think I always quote the first part of it, and I, I leave off that section, and I don't know why. That's a great section too, great is your faithfulness. And then it says right after that, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Who was writing the Lamentations? Anybody know? Who was? Yeah, Jeremiah. He, he wrote the book of Jeremiah, of course, but this was his lament. Again, here's a, a pastor that n- never got to lead anybody to the Lord, at least that we know of. It was uh, his whole struggle with Israel was saying, you know, uh, you're going to get whooped on by Babylon pretty soon, and, and they all hated him and even threw him in prison. And, and so they call him the weeping prophet, and it's just a, like bummer kind of ministry, but that's what he did. And, and with that, and so as he's writing this down, it's just a, incredible. He's talking about the steadfast love of the Lord, his mercies new every morning, and, and great is your faithfulness, and and the Lord's his portion, and I'm going to hope in him. And he continued to do that over and over. Whoops, I need to go back. Sorry. I forgot I put all three up at the same time. Can I go back? Can you do a back arrow for me? All right. And then, I don't know where you are now. <laughs> there you go. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and the rest will build from there. There we go. <laughs> or not. Okay, so the second one is God gives rest. I did the same thing. God gives rest. Today, we have, we as believers, have spiritual rest through Christ. Now, again, as I'm, I'm using these analogies and connecting them in with us, we, it's not fair to always do that in Scripture. We have to be careful of that. Sometimes it's just a promise to Israel, and we as a church can't automatically take that and take it as our promises. Uh, but I'm saying, as he's giving them rest, he promises us rest also. That's all I'm saying. So today, we have a spiritual rest through Christ. Remember when Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you, all right, rest. But we also see in Hebrews chapter 4, I know the the Yams, our young adult ministry, has been going through Hebrews and hit chapter 4, and 10 times it uses that word rest, just in that one little chapter there, that we will one day enter into eternal rest. And so you and I, when we come to Christ, he gives us a rest, but then there's still this one out into the future that we look forward to, this eternal rest. And so in Hebrews 4, 8, 9, he even points us back to Joshua where he says, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. And so then there remains a Sabbath rest or an appointed rest for the people of God. So he's like, don't forget about that ultimate rest. It's, it's still coming and I, I still promise promise it to you. I did it again. Okay, the third one, you don't have to go back. God gives the victory. I'm getting trigger happy. God gives the victory. And that's what he was saying in verse 44 there, just that reminder. They're settled into the land. They chased everybody out that needed to be chased out. They get to finally rest and enjoy. Remember, they had been in the wilderness so long, and that wilderness is just desert. 
no trees, nothing. It's just desert. I've, I've driven through it. It's, it's, it's terrible. It's a terrible desert. That's where they've been, and they've been on the move, and you're living in, out of a tent with about a million of your close friends, and with that, when they finally get in the land, I mean, you get to plant a garden. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to have, uh, you know, all these incredible foods instead of just manna, and, and so with that, but he reminds them, the Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. Now, one of their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given them all their enemies into their hands. It's, it's God's reminder of, remember that I, I did this. It wasn't your awesome, you know, ninja moves that you did on them and, and, uh, and tearing them up, uh, but ultimately I was fighting through you. God gives the victory. What a great reminder of that. All right. Honorable discharge. Uh, let me read verses one through nine in chapter 22. At that time, Joshua summoned the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh and said to them, you have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and you have obeyed my voice and all that I've commanded you. You have not forsaken your brothers these many days down to this day, but you have been, excuse me, careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God has given rest to your brothers and he, as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. Only be very careful to observe the commandment and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to keep his commandments, to cling to him, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Joshua blessed them. I'm going to go back. Sorry. I took away your thing. Sorry. So Joshua blessed them in verse uh, 6 and sent them away, and they went to their tents. Now to the one half of the tribe of Manasseh, Moses had given a possession in Bashan, but to, uh, to the other half, Joshua had given a possession beside their brothers in the land west of the Jordan. And when Joshua sent them away to their homes and blessed them, he said to them, go back to your tents with much wealth and with very much livestock, with silver and gold, bronze and iron, and with much clothing. Divide the spoil of your enemies with your brothers. Uh, so the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh returned home parting from the people of Israel at Shiloh, uh, which is in the land of Canaan, to go to the land of Gilead, their own land in which they had possessed themselves by command uh, of the Lord through Moses. All right, let me see if I can do this without touching it one more time. Map, beautiful. Okay, let's draw a circle around it. There you go. Okay, so just to the left side of the inside red part of that line there is the Jordan River, right? And so we have the Sea of Galilee at the top, Dead Sea at the bottom. And so with that, I'm kind of trying to hug that line there. And so Israel is on this side today. Jordan, the country of Jordan, obviously on the other side there. And so that's to the, be the, that's the east side of Jordan. That's, that's this group that he's talking about. So there's two and a half tribes asked earlier on, hey, can we land on the other side? And so they did. And the only thing is keep all of your fighting men here. So they can go settle to your families, that's fine. But then you have to come back and fight with your brethren to clean up the promised land and push out the Canaanites and Perizzites and all the otherites and pushes them all out of the land. So this is, it's all over with now. The seven years is done. They're completed. You guys did what you were asked to do. Now the promise is fulfilled. You get to go back now and get to go settle in your land. So that's what, that's what the Lord's doing. The Lord had kept his promises. You guys kept your promises. And so um, we're all good and they're allowed to go home. The land has been subdued, but it's, been, it's taken a, definitely a physical toll, an emotional toll, even a, a spiritual toll. They're weary. And think of the, the toll that war takes on anyone. Seven years of straight war, and they're finally getting to go home to their, to their family. So Joshua basically gives all the fighting men of the 12 tribes of Israel their honorable discharge, and they're released, and they, they take off now. All right, Joshua mentions uh, this three-point uh, commission. He commended them for their faithful servant. That's verses one through four that we read, uh, basically saying you guys did a good job. Secondly, Joshua commanded them to obey the Lord and serve him sincerely. And I love, and I want to just repeat them, he gives five imperatives that were given to them as they go. They're in verse five. To the love of the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, to cling to him, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. 
It sounds good for us tonight also, right? A good reminder. Uh, they've been told this before, but again, as you go, kind of a blessing as you go, reminder, warning, uh, but d- take these five things with you and make sure that you're doing them. And then the third one there, that Joshua cautioned them not to become selfish, but to share their spoils with the brethren, and that's seven through nine. And so they have all of this, all these spoils of war, and they're going to go back now, and he's like, share it with your brethren. Don't be a whore. Don't hoard it all. I remember going into um, when uh, Russia in 91, you know, early 90s there, when basically communist uh, Russia fell. And I remember going in with Jeff Thompson, and we went in a number of times. He, he went in a number of times, but um, I did two or three times, and we went into different uh, youth prisons and sharing the gospel over there. And so, but as we did it, I remember you know, talking to so many people because that was the buzz, right? It's a, it's a new Russia now, and they're trying to figure out capitalism. And of course, in our ignorance, we're going over there going, isn't capitalism the best thing? A lot better than communism. And they're all saying, no, absolutely not. You don't change something from so many different decades. He says, what we had in communism was, well, we had a place to stay. They took care of our heating. We had water. We had food, we had all these different things, and now it all just went away. And so we're freezing to death. And I remember we'd get out in these subways, and I remember underneath the subways underneath Moscow there, and I just remember you'd get off the train, and there would be, as lo- far as the eye could see, of two, two rows of uh, a lot of women, some men, that basically got off work and would stand there, and they would hold one thing, and they would stand there. It might be a pair of shoes. It might be a bottle of champagne. It was something that they were just holding. They didn't have champagne. It was probably you know, cheap wine or whatever it was. But, and, they were all hold, and they were all hoping to make that one sale. And all the way out, all the way up the stairs, up to the top of that, there'd be the line. I'll just never get that picture out of my mind of just kind of what was going on back in that time. Well, after that, it was the first time now all of a sudden Russia owned all the property. Think about how huge Russia is, right? And so government owned everything. And now there's going to be, well, now you could purchase things. Well, who do you think got all the land to be able to distribute? All of the oligarchs and all of the, and so again, the wealthier got wealthier and the poor got poorer. And it was, it was just a, a terrible time especially for their first 10 years in, in having to, 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 to deal with that. So this is, this is new for them. They have all of this and go back, hey, be generous, share. They're your brothers you know, and your sisters. Make sure that you share with them. And he sends them off with that. Next, we have uh, a different scenario. This altar of, of witness pops up. So I'll read uh, um, different sections of this. But here's a kind of a a classic case for misunderstandings, a classic case of conflict resolution studies, although it may illustrate how not to practice such efforts. So let's learn from maybe their their mistakes here. And so our first one we're going to look at is the first 10, 10 through 12 about building an altar. When they came to the region of the Jordan, that is in the land of Canaan, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan an altar of imposing size, imposing size. What is, what's happening here? What, 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 what are they doing here? I'll continue on to verse 11. And the people of Israel heard it said, behold, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, listen to this, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. These are their brothers that have been fighting with them side by side for the last seven years, help them to conquer all of their land. They go home and they do this one thing. They set up this altar and they're already sharpening their swords, right? Pulling out switchblades, nunchuckers, whatever else they got. And they're ready to go to blows immediately. That's scary. The land was at rest. For the eastern tribes were restless because the Jordan River separated them from their brethren, and they're trying to figure out, what, 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 what do we do here? Well, let's move on to verse 13 through, uh, 13 through 20. What happens next? Then the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Now, it's a little 
they're, they're both Israel, but they're calling Israel the one and what we know as the promised land or the holy land of Israel today. And then they always have to name all two and a half tribes. And that's where we have that distinction there. So the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad and half tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priest. And with him, 10 chiefs, 10 chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, every one of them, the head of the family among the clans of Israel. And they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad and half tribe of Manasseh in the land of Gilead. And they said to them, thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. Now, did, did you pick up on something? It's normally thus saith the Lord. That's not what they're saying. Thus says the whole congregation of the Lord. This is what everybody else says over there. What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the Lord God, excuse me, the God of Israel in turning away this day from the following the Lord? by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord. Have we not had enough of the sin at Peor from which even yet we had not cleansed ourselves and from which there uh, came a plague upon the congregation of the Lord that you too must turn away this day from following the Lord? And if you too rebel against the Lord today, then tomorrow he'll be angry with the whole congregation of Israel. I think they're kind of just thinking about themselves here. Yeah, God's going to whoop on you, but we know what happened last time. The plague hit all of us, right? Verse 19, but now if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into the Lord's land where the Lord's tabernacle stands and take for yourselves a possession amongst us. Only do not rebel against the Lord or make us as rebels by building for yourselves an altar other than the altar of the Lord our God. Did not Achan, remember the sin of Achan back in chapter seven, the son of Zerah, break faith in the matter of the devoted things? And the wrath fell upon all the congregation of Israel, and he did not perish alone for his iniquity. So, Phinehas, he's got an Egyptian name that means dark-skinned. That's what we know about him. Well, no, we know a little bit more. He's actually the grandson of Aaron. And so his dad is Eleazar here, which is the son of Aaron. So he's the grandson of Aaron. So a direct descendant of Aaron. Aaron himself, that first high priest. Phineas also has this zeal. Uh, he has a, a zeal for God, and he has a zeal to uh, protect Israel's purity. So he's actually a really good guy. We've got some great stories of him, and uh, he plays a very prominent role in four significant episodes in Israel's formative period. Uh, he mentions Peor in, I don't know what verse it was, uh, verse 17 there, and back in the book of Numbers in chapter 25, it talks about Baal Peor. Baal simply means, uh, it's, uh, it means master, it means God. And there are many different Baals in the land at that time. But in Numbers 25, an Israelite named Zimri brought a Midianite woman, her name was Cosby, into the Israelite camp. And so he brings a, a Midianite into the camp, apparently for purposes of ritual sexual intercourse. So it's a bad news. When Phineas hears about this, he runs into their tent while they're having sex, takes a big old giant uh, spear and runs them both through with it. That was Phineas. And he was patted on the back by God saying, well done. And it stopped this plague that was taking place because of their sin at the time. That's a gory story and whatever else. But the point is, that's this dude, Phineas, where he hears this the altar goes up. It's like, what is this? And so it's just like brings 10 guys with him and goes over and is confronting them with them. But I'll just tell you in advance, he was 100% wrong. They have a reason why they built the altar. And it never even comes to his mind of maybe handling this a little bit differently. There's a misunderstanding here. And you and I have done the same thing, right? You jump to conclusions and you're just out and you're ready to go to blows because this is wrong. And, and you know you're right because you have the righteousness of God on your side. And what are that, what's that Christian doing? What are they thinking? What are they? We can fall into that same trap. Let's read the next section and Hear the other side. Hear what's going on. Verse 21 through 29. Then the people of Rudin, Ru, not Rudin, Reuben, the people of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, and this is where I quoted it earlier, the mighty one, God, the Lord, the mighty one, God, the Lord, he knows 
and let Israel itself know if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today. And so he's ready to kind of lay this on thick as he goes through this. But let me just say that he uses El, Elohim, Yahweh. Th those are the three names, El or the mighty one. God himself is basically saying, if, we're, if we did something wrong here, may God strike us dead. That's, that's basically how much they know that they're in the right. Listen to our heart. Listen to what we're doing here. He says, if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against the Lord, do not spare us today. Verse 23. For building an altar to turn away from, the, from following the Lord, like if that's what we did. Or if we did so to burn, uh, offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace offerings on it. May the Lord himself take vengeance. But then he says in verse 24, no, but we did it from fear that in time to come, your children might say to our children, what have you to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan, I mean the, the river Jordan, a boundary between us and you, you people of Reuben and people of Gad. You have no portion in the Lord. And so your children might make our children cease to worship the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us now build an altar, not for burnt offering, not for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you and between our generations after us that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence with our burnt offerings and sacrifices and peace offerings so your children will not say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. And we thought if this should be said to us or our descendants in time to come, we should say, behold, the copy of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, not for sacrifice, but to be a witness between us and you. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn away this day from following the Lord by building an altar for, burning, uh, for burnt offerings, grain offering or sacrifice, other than the altar of the Lord our God that stands before his tabernacle. Did they have a reason? Yes. Did they have a pretty good reason? Yes. What they were doing was for unity's sake, for the next generations in that, but what they saw was this altar, which was a copy of their altar where they did the burnt off offering sacrifices. So I can see, you know, we can all understand how they jump to conclusions in that. But with that, it's always good asking, I was going to say asking questions, but he actually asked questions. But the way he asked his questions were all accusations, you know, that you've turned away from the faith and, you know, things like that. So it's like, ah, okay, let me just read the end and then we'll just grab some uh, practical points and then we'll wrap up. Verse 30, when Phinehas, the priests and the chiefs of the congregation, the heads of the families of Israel who were with him, heard the words that the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the people of Manasseh spoke, it was good in their eyes. And then Phinehas, the son of Eleazar the priest, said to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the people of Manasseh, today we know that the Lord is in our midst because you have not committed this breach of faith against the Lord. Now you have delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the Lord. Man, if they would have just came over without coming and talking with them and just sharpened their sword and came over the river and just started slaying people, man, God would have dealt with them so strictly. Verse 32, then Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the priests and the chiefs returned from the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the land of Gilead to the land of Canaan to the people of Israel and brought back word to them. Verse 33, and the report was good in their eyes of the people of Israel. People of Israel blessed God and spoke no more of making war against them to destroy the land where the people of Reuben and the people of Gad were settled. The people of Reuben and the, I can't say Reuben tonight. The people of Reuben and for the people of Gad called the altar witness, for they said it is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Awesome. Here's the problem. You just stop fighting your enemy when you have a common enemy to fight against. Seven years you've been fighting against this enemy. That enemy goes away, and what happens? We start fighting against us, ourselves, right? That, that's exactly what is taking place here. And, and interesting, all of this, they, it comes down to in verse 11, and the people of Israel heard it said. It's hearsay. It's gossip. It's rumor. It's jealousy, it's their altar's bigger than our altar, you know, who knows, but, but with that, it's, it's all of this hearsay that they're building all of this from. Here's a good word right here. Nope, sorry, I never gave you the right one. Messing up on my keynote. Assumption 
leads to accusation, but communication leads to clarification. Right to go over and say, dude, what's up? Right? Let the, what's happening here? Tell us about your altar. Why would you do that? You know, and, and asking about it and letting them speak about it, then all of those verses of just saying, how could you? How dare you? How about the benefit of the doubt? How about love believes all things? How about trust and verify? It's not a scripture, but a good wisdom. Or I have a few questions. Assume less, communicate more. Here's some simple principles also that might help us when it comes to misunderstandings. Three responds. Respond with a concern for God's holiness. That's good. That's what Phinehas, that's, that, that's been his life. It's what he does. It's his business. He's the priest and, and uh, dad's the high priest. And so with that, it should be concerning. And so you should have a concern for God's holiness. That's always a good thing. Secondly, respond with the courage to confront in love. Thirdly, respond with an attempt to reconcile before you fight. And so in that, in that sense, instead of just saying, yeah, let's go to war and go and do that, there's a number of good steps that are here, but of course, some that are not. On the other side of this, uh, uh, three more. Determine that you're willing to sacrifice to help them. Don't confront unless you're willing to, to help. Now, they did do that. I, I, I get that to Phineas there. He's saying, he's pleading at one point with them and saying, brothers, come back on this side. Stay on this side. If that's what's causing you to do that, or you have these fears, we'll give you some of our land. Come back over here and we'll portion some out to you. And so that was awesome. Also determine that you'll see the situation from the perspective of the other person. That's hard to do because you have your mind made up or at least we don't think that we do, but a lot of times we do. And so with that, to be able to go over with open-ended questions and, and really giving them the benefit of the doubt to be able to, I'm gonna try to hear you out. Thirdly, determine that you will believe the best of one another. And so maybe some, just some simple points for that. Now, why didn't they build some other kind of monument? Because that's ultimately what this thing was. There's a lot of different monuments. We've already covered a number of them in the book of Joshua where they would rise up, raise up uh, you know, a handful of stones when they, uh, right when they you know, got on the other side of the Jordan River and they did that on the other, in, in the river and then just on the other side of the river and they had raised up an Ebenezer, they'd raise up these stones, a monument in that place. That's all this was, was a monument. Why did they have it? Why, why didn't you pick a different shape? Like, why did you pick the altar? Maybe you would have kept yourselves out of this or, you know, from being misunderstood. But I, I think their answer would be that they knew the true basis of their unity was their common worship, which is centered in the sacrifices on the altar. That's what brings them together. Uh, the blood being shed and the sacrifices just as ours is with Christ. I think another thing to, to take from this is know your enemy. Well, it's you and I remember in our day, we think through our enemy. The world isn't our enemy. The world is not our enemy. The world is actually our harvest field, right? That's, that's, that's what he calls us into. He leaves us in and then calls us into this, this, this harvest field. And so our real enemy, who is our real enemy? What's your thoughts? Who's, your, who's our real enemy? Flesh, okay. The enemy being who? Satan. Satan himself, right? Yeah, the world of flesh and the devil, but not the world in the sense of the, those in the world. And with that, we have to define that out and what we mean by that. But the one who's here to rob and kill and destroy, he's ultimately the, the, the one behind all of that. And that's, we need to know our enemy. And before you declare war on your Christian brother or sister, stop to ask questions. Find out what's going on. Maybe it's sin. And then you can deal with that. But maybe it's in a misunderstanding. Or maybe it's just a different philosophy of ministry. I remember when I, when I, when I learned those three, it, it really helped me. It was somebody, somebody had come to church and was, uh, at the time, we were really, we were real legalistic about, there was never a child in the sanctuary, like not one. You had to be tackled to the ground and it's like, go to the, you know, and now it's just like, whatever. Do you want to bring your kids in? Whatever. But, you know, I mean, we'd, it was just one of our military friends was a dear friend of mine and he was just, it, he wasn't going to have it. And so with that, 
and it, it was just, we took it to a crazy degree and everything else, but at the time, it was our philo philosophy of ministry. I don't think it was a sin issue on our part. It was a philosophy of ministry. We have a philosophy of ministry that we think that kids will, are able to get taught better at their age level. They're not going to listen to me on a Sunday morning. They're going to be bored. And so with that, uh, we try to teach them at their age level. That's, that's not, we can't go in here and find that. I think it's partly common sense. It's a philosophy of ministry, right? And so whether a church doesn't do that, you go to, it's just like, man, I was so distracted by kids in their sanctuary. It's like, why don't they do it the right way? No, 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 no. Just because we do it that way, right? It's just a simply a philosophy of ministry. Doesn't automatically put it in the sin category. And, and so with that, we just got to give each other a little bit of grace, amen. The building of the altar was at first misunderstood as a declaration of war, but then it became a witness of peace and unity. It was exactly the opposite. That's what they were hoping, that it was to be about peace and unity, that we are united in that, and they completely took it the other way. Proverbs 18, 13, if one gives an answer before he hears it, it is his folly and shame. How are we looking on time? We're over time. Okay, we're going to stop. If one gives an answer before he hears it, it's his folly and shame. And so let's ask good questions. Let's give people the, the benefit of the doubt. The love believes all things. Let's go with that attitude, that spirit. And again, a lot of times that's hard to do because we hear something, we believe that person that said that, and we're ready to take somebody's head off. Lord, help us. Let's pray. Father, give us grace. You have given us so much grace. Others have given us so much grace. Help us in return to be able to show that grace to others. And with that, Lord, that we, you would uh, help us in asking good questions and truly being concerned about those questions and, and truly asking uh, because we, we, we want to hear their side. We want to hear their view. We want to first hear that. Uh, help us to be slow to speak and, and, and just quick to, uh, uh, to hear. As we say, we have uh, two ears and one mouth. May we remember that. Listen twice as much as we speak. Help us with that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.